Broadcasting across California. California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson, and with us in studio for the very first time is Andrew Yang. We've spoken a lot of times in the field and via Zoom and everything, but it's great to have you in the house for the first time. It's great to be here, Alex. Thanks for having me. And of course, he's here to talk about his new book and his new political party. Let's put this book up on the screen. It is called Forward, Notes on the Future of Our Democracy. You can attend a special event for the book and meet him on Sunday at 3 p.m. at the Irvine Spectrum. Tickets and information on the book available at andrewyang.com. And I gotta say, I read the entire book, and it's really, really good because it's really, really you. <laughs> it's funny. It's oh, different. It challenges a lot of things. Um, not everybody might agree with all the solutions you come up with, but I think it, uh, most people will agree with the problems, and I think it's very well done. So congratulations. Thanks, Alex. I wrote it after I came off the presidential trail, trying to share my journey as a candidate, which obviously you saw in the book, but also why we feel so stuck as a country, why it seems like we can't make the kind of progress that many of us would like to see. Uh, and I, I distilled those lessons in the book. Uh, so the, the thing, though, that's getting the most attention is the last chapter, uh, which is when you announce essentially that you're leaving the Democratic Party to form a new party called Forward. You've got Forward on your lapel right here uh, oh, yeah, right thank now. Oh, yeah, noticing. <laughs> um, so why leave the Democratic Party? Right now, polarization is at record levels in the United States. 42% of both Democrats and Republicans regard their political opponents as evil uh, or their mortal enemies. And unfortunately, this dynamic is going to get worse, not better. So I formed the Forward Party to change that dynamic, to change the mechanics, because this two-party system is going to lead us to progressive dysfunction and eventually violence and ruin. Here's where I'm confused. So you say uh, towards the end of the book that uh, if you're a part of the forward party, you can still be a part of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. What does that mean? Is forward an idea or is it an actual party the way that like libertarianism or Green Party is a party with a slate of candidates and a nominating convention? What is it? Forward is an inclusive, popular movement, and the mechanics right now of our politics make it such that if you were to change your party registration, you might lose your ability to participate in your local election. Right. So we're also practical. You know, I'm the math guy. This is a movement of reasonableness and reason to try and get our heads up, try and get uh, beyond the partisan back and forth that's making us more angry, more frustrated, and it's dehumanizing our fellow Americans who might be on the other side of a particular issue. You know, there are a lot of Democrats that will say, look, there are problems with the Democratic Party, but there's a big difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Let's take this in infrastructure issue, which is the big issue to being debated in Washington right now. There's a fight between the Democrats. Bernie Sanders wants six trillion in spending. Joe Manchin maybe wants one trillion in spending. Mitch McConnell wants zero in spending. Uh, and there's a big difference between uh, what would happen if Mitch McConnell was running the Senate versus Chuck Schumer. What do you say to those folks? Well, first, I think the infrastructure package was signed off on by 19 Republican senators. So that was genuinely a bipartisan effort, which has been a rarity in the, Washington. The infrastructure, not the, not the build, but yes. better reconciliation. Yeah, reconciliation, you're totally right. That, that, uh, that, that's very much along party lines. And the parties do have different visions. You can be aligned with one party's vision or the other. Um, but the incentives right now that have captured our political representatives make it so that there are incentives not to compromise. Right. And so if you want to see things happen out of Washington, you have to look and say, is it working right now? And then what can we do to change it? And there's actually a real life example of this where California has led the way by shifting to open primaries. Uh, if you had open primaries in states around the country, you'd see better governance and more compromise as so a result. So open primaries, for people that may not know, means that instead of it just being a Democratic primary where you got two Democrats running against each other or more, two Republicans running against each other, everybody runs and then the top two people advance. Could be Democrat, 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 Republican, Democrat, Green, whatever. That's what we do here. You actually want it to be five people that would advance, unlike two. Uh, but, but the other big thing you talk about is ranked choice voting, which you say is the key to all of this, which is a term some people may not be familiar with. So it, real briefly, how do you explain ranked choice voting? I would love to talk about ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is the solution to our polarization. And it's a voting process where you get to support up to five candidates, one, two, three, four, five. And the first candidate who gets majority support 
wins. So th what this does is it makes it so that you have to appeal to a broad coalition. You have to try and get a majority of people on board. If you're the sort of candidate that, let's say, really inflames and excites 30% of people but turns off another 60%, then this is going to make it so you probably don't win. So ranked choice voting in combination with open primaries would unlock all new political uh, perspectives that right now don't make it because of our duopoly system and our plurality voting system, which is archaic, and it ends up marginalizing a lot of Americans. How do you actually get this sort of stuff passed, though? Um, because I know there's some, even on the left, that are frustrated that Democrats have supported open primaries, have supported uh, nonpartisan redistricting in a state like California, and that Republicans in states that they control aren't doing sort of things like that, and so it's actually really advantage Republicans. How do you make this happen? California, again, has led on this, uh, Alex, and there's one state Alaska, which is a red state, that has actually switched to open primaries and ranked choice voting. And you've seen a difference in the kind of decisions that, for example, Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska has been making, in part because she doesn't have to answer to the 10 to 20 percent most extreme voters in Alaska. She can try and answer to the 51 percent, which I, I'd suggest is what we all want. So if we can make that switch in more states around the country, we'll see more legislators acting in the public interest as opposed to the partisan interest. But just like they did in Alaska and they've done in California, 24 states have ballot initiatives where you can make this happen in real life right now. And that's what the Ford Party's focus is, trying to get these ballot initiatives across the finish line in November 22. So is more of the focus on initiatives versus necessarily candidates? Is that where most of the focus is now? We're going to support candidates, too. And the candidates we're going to support are going to be running in Democratic uh, and Republican primaries, uh, because that's just a practical thing. But if they're aligned with our vision around uh, a more dynamic political system, uh, and for things like term limits for members of Congress, which is another tenet right. uh, uh, that most Americans agree with, um, then we're going to back candidates in local races. We're, there are actually some candidates we're talking to right here in California uh, about supporting right now. So you'll probably see him again, because I'll be here to support various uh, California candidates. What about uh, the, a presidential candidate? Are, uh, are you going to run for president, or is there somebody else that you would back as a forward candidate? My focus is on November 22. We have 13 months to try and make meaningful progress for our country. Uh, and I, I think it's going to be very natural for people to be thinking about 24, but 24 will be here soon enough. Let's focus on 22 for now. Okay, he didn't say no if you just uh, were listening to that. Okay, so the, the hallmark of your presidential campaign was the big issue of universal basic income, what you call the freedom dividend. The issue this, is universal basic income. There we go. Look at him. That's how he does it. So this is what you said about it on the campaign trail when we were with you. Soon, this is going to be the idea of the American people that takes us all the way to the White House. That was in MacArthur Park, which is actually the start of your book. Uh, so, obviously, it didn't take you to the White House, but a lot of California cities are now experimenting with universal basic income. We're talking about uh, Compton and Long Beach and Oakland and Los Angeles and Stockton, of course, one of the main homes of this. Um, here is what Long Beach Mayor Robert Garcia told us last year when talking about universal basic income and working with you. I'm sure the Yang Gang is uh, now all following you. That's, uh, that's quite the uh, online army out there as well. <laughs> we love the Yang Gang. He loves the Yang Gang. I'm sure you love uh, what's happening when it comes to uh, California itself now, a, a pilot program that the governor endorsed in the budget. What do you make of what's happening here when it comes to universal basic income, and where do you see that going nationally? California does tend to be ahead of the curve uh, on these kinds of policies, and I'm, I'm so thrilled with Mayor Garcia and other leaders who are piloting and building out implementations uh, around the state. A poll just came out that said two-thirds of Americans nationwide now support universal basic income. So what started out as a campaign idea that some people thought was ahead of its time now, now is right in front of us. The child tax credit that's been improving millions of American lives, uh, it should be here to stay. And if you think about it, that's actually a foundation for a universal basic income. And the child tax credit is being negotiated in that reconciliation bill, whether that will be extended right now. It's just a temporary thing. Uh, bigger question, though, about workers, which was really also at the center of your campaign, uh, talking about automation and the future of where we go from here. We've had this watershed moment because of the pandemic, where a lot of people are rethinking their jobs, a lot of people have left their jobs, labor is at an interesting place of leverage right now that it hasn't been in a long time. What do you make 
of this moment and what it tells us about our country? It's a really tough time for a, a lot of families, a lot of communities, and there are many Americans who've been rethinking the way they spend their time. Some of them have been making changes in terms of their jobs or careers. One thing I would suggest is that we should not be putting money into people's hands and tying it to not working, which is the case right now with a lot of the unemployment benefits we have. I'm friends with, uh, uh, with some young people who actually just tell me, probably confidentially, but whatever. They say, look, I'm getting paid 80% of what I was gonna get paid at a job, on unemployment right now, so I'm gonna ride this out until it ends and then I'm gonna look for a job. Mm -hmm. And so if we do that uh, nationwide, it will have a distorting effect. In my mind, this money that we're putting out shouldn't have those kinds of conditions attached because then if you decide to go back to a job or, or work uh, part-time even, then you'll be able to keep that money too. Up next, uh, we're gonna reflect on the 2020 race, which is something Andrew Yang does a lot in this book, including a lot of the fun that he had. You know that we like to dance on this show. Um, so here is a video done by one of your supporters on YouTube, Voyage, Voignant, I think, featuring your theme song, Return of the Mac, and videos of you on the trail. So feel free to dance as we go to break with Return of the Mac. I've never been to a political event quite like this before. What makes this different? What makes the Yang Gang different? Well, a lot of people here are different, ready for a different kind of campaign, different kind of candidate. That was Andrew Yang on the issue is in September of 2019. His campaign, certainly unconventional, was a different kind of candidate, including crowd surfing video. His new book, Forward, tells the inside story of the 2020 race. Andrew Yang is back with us to talk about it. That was in MacArthur Park, which is actually the beginning of the entire book. Talks about that night, the first night that I met you. And thank you for the shout out in the book. No, there isn't one, but that's okay. Um, Andrew Yang, uh, let's talk though, because you being on the campaign trail, you get to really learn about yourself and also learn about America. What do you think is the biggest lesson you learned about this country being out on the road actually talking to people every day? The biggest lesson I learned was that if you sit down and talk to Americans, we agree on much, much more than you would believe if you just watch the news media. Uh, and in the book, I talk about the fact that the correlation between someone's policy perspectives and their self-identified political leanings has a very low correlation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it turns out if you talk to someone about, for example, lower drug prices, who's a Republican, they'd be like, oh yeah, hate those drug companies and whatnot. Um, uh, and so that's the barrier we have to break through. Right now, again, all the incentives are around imagining that we're in these two warring factions. Uh, and it, it's not the case when you actually sit down with Americans. It's one reason why I'm so passionate about the forward party. What do you think you learned about yourself being out on the road? Well, it's fun, Alex, and, I, and you read the book, you know, but I'm an entrepreneur and operator, and so you just try and compete. Um, but I will say that being a candidate is completely different than anything else because you have to put yourself out there more than you probably ever imagine. And I, what I learned about myself was that the more I shared about my own humanity, the better we did. Uh, and now I, I feel this profound gratitude and connection to hundreds of thousands, even millions of Americans who got behind me in the campaign. Because it really is remarkable, if you think about it, how much better you did in that campaign than a lot of established elected officials who had been doing it for longer and maybe had more money to start off. Uh, you, you were able to do this because of being authentic and being you. And I think there is this great craving for some authenticity in politics when so much of it is not. And, and part of it you talk about is all these viral moments that happened, right? Uh, the fact that you went crowd surfing and that got more attention here in Orange County than anything you said that day on the stage. And it, it changed the way you maybe thought about the media itself and, and the way that people comprehend information these days. Yeah, our media organizations have very distinct incentives. I, I will say, Alex, you're an exceptional journalist because you always try and got, get to the substance of it. You had your own point of view. But the, the incentives reward people who will do something that's frankly a little bit more clickbaity and sensationalist uh, than someone who's going to be making a substantive argument. Um, and we adapted, obviously, though it wasn't all intentional. It's like, it's not like we're like, hey, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to crowd serve. I mean, it's just like, it just sort of happens. Um, but then you lean into it because you realize that that's breaking through in a way that other things are not. And people can connect to it. Another way that you connected to people is through basketball. Uh, you played basketball on the campaign trail. It was your debate preparation, right, to get yourself in a, a different headspace. 
Yeah, it, it's tough running uh, for president. It's tough being a political candidate. I really admire everyone who decides to run for office because um, uh, it's, uh, it takes its toll. And so just getting the blood flowing and feeling like a normal guy <laughs> like helped, helped me try and gear up for these presidential debates because there was so much attention and pressure being put on the debates uh, every single time. And in many cases on the trail, I wasn't sure if that debate was going to be my last debate because each time they would raise the threshold and then I was like, well, I think I can get to the next <laughs> threshold, but, you know, this might be the last one. So like, every time there was an immense uh, amount riding on it. Well, when we spoke to you on the campaign trail as you were doing debate prep, here's what I told you. We've got a basketball hoop in our studio, so at really? some point, uh, we hope you'll come join us in the studio. I would show, love showcase that. Showcase your stuff. Yeah, we'll Andrew love that. Yang, thank you so much. So, promises made, promises kept. Uh, so, we're bringing out the basketball hoop for you. Uh, in the studio. Do you want to come on and, and showcase your moves? Wow, I'm take, you're I, made of your word, I, I'm, Alex. I've taken off the jacket, you're, uh, and let's let's see how this is. I mean, we, we got we got to see as if those videos are really true, because you can you can edit stuff, you know. Um, yes. So here we go. Welcome to our uh, our court so here. Fun. So my mic is in the jacket, so I feel like I have to keep the jacket on. But look at that guy. Yeah. Sharpshooter. Am I going to start dribbling? Woo! <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at that. Andrew <laughs> Yang. Ah. Oh, here you go. Oh, yeah. There we Everyone go. Everyone watching at home, you should know this man is six foot five inches tall. Should we try? Should we try to dunk it one time? <laughs> Do it. Oh. Ah. There we go. Six foot five. Andrew Yang, ladies and gentlemen. The book and the party is forward. Check him out. We'll have the debate coming next. We're over here. This is the camera. Thank you. <laughs> there there we go, Thank you, California. Yeah. See you in Irvine Sunday.